Good morning, Shore Life. If you're watching our video, uh, I'm assuming that uh, you won't be able to make it to the park today and we'll miss you and, and we understand uh, this is a, a risky time and we all have to make the best choices based on our health, uh, based on our knowledge, based how, on how God is directing us. But we do miss you, we love you. Please, please read through the emails we sent and, and connect. Uh, you can email the, the church elders for prayer requests at elders at shorelife.org. Um, there's opportunities to connect through video and, and through prayer. Uh, if there's somebody you really want to connect with and you don't know how to connect with them, contact me, email me at andrew at shorelife.org. Let me, we're not going to make romance connections here. We're not matchmakers in that way, but we do want each and every uh, part of our body to, to stay connected to the church. We're going to continue our study this morning. Would you pray with me? Father God, we ask that you would bless us through your scripture, through your Holy Spirit. Lord, it's not my words, but it is your truths that we need to grab hold of. And I pray that we are changed, that our minds are changed. Father, through your word and through your truths. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for each and every person who is watching this video, who is going to connect, uh, who we will see this morning at, at the park as we worship. God, I pray that you would direct all of us and continually bring each other up in our minds so that we would pray, pray for each other. We offer up this morning to you in your name. Amen. We're going to be in Daniel chapter, chapter 1 today. Let me read a story. It's very pertinent to today, our time. An outbreak of cholera is nothing to take lightly. And in September 1996, Manila, the capital city of the Philippines, was in the grip of an outbreak of cholera of this plague. 300 people were suffering from acute symptoms of the disease, and seven were already dead as the summer was just starting. The source of the problem was not a mystery. In the rainy season of August and September, the streets and the sewage canals of Manila became flooded and clogged. Flies and cockroaches uh, proliferate, feed on the trash that floats on the surface, and become carriers of the germs, cholera. To combat the epidemic, Alfredo Lim, the mayor of Manila, had a novel idea. He put a bounty on flies and cockroaches. One peso, four cents, for every ten flies brought dead or alive. And one, uh, one and a half pesos, or, or six cents, for every ten cockroaches brought dead or alive. Health officials targeted some of the poorest areas in the city. And on the first day of the program, officials from the Department of Public Health went into the Paco district. Residents brought thousands and thousands of insects in plastic bags and were paid on the spot. If we kill the flies at once, said the chief of the health department, we could stop the spread of these diseases. Creepy little things like flies and cockroaches carry disease. In our minds, we have thousands and thousands and millions of thoughts. In fact, most of our thoughts are just automatic. They're ingrained in us. We have these thoughts going on in our head, and some of them are out of control. This summer, we're talking about changing our minds, changing our thoughts. Rather than letting our thoughts run rampant, I mean, we're filled with pride. We're filled with, with selfishness. We're controlled by sinful desires. It causes us to think like the world. And we want to think differently. If we think differently, if our minds are changed by God, then we will act differently. We will live differently. Philippians 4.8, our theme verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. We want to change our minds. So this morning we're going to look 
As we study whatever is pure, we're going to look at the story of Daniel. Now, anytime we pull a story out of context, I like to put it in the context. So bear with me as we take the story of Daniel and put it in context. Daniel is a prophet in the Old Testament. So Daniel lived before Jesus Christ came on this earth. He lived in a very trying time in Israel. So let's look at Israel's history in a nutshell. God called Abraham, book of Genesis, God called Abraham to be the leader of a new people, to be the father of a nation. And so he moves him into the promised land and Abraham had Isaac and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel and Israel had 12 sons, the 12 tribes. Well, the nation was very young still, actually they weren't even a nation there were about 70 people, and there was a famine in the land. So God moved them down into Egypt to save them. And in Egypt, they went from 70 to over a million people. And Egypt was very scared of this growing population. And so they enslaved the people. They tried to suppress them and oppress them so that they wouldn't grow. But it had the reverse effect. Eventually, God, through Moses, led the nation of Israel out of Egypt and up to the promised land. Now, what should have been a one-year journey took 40 years because of Israel's disobedience, because of their lack of trust in God. But eventually they enter into the promised land and they conquer the people, the enemies of God, and they overtake the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. Now, God is their king, but the people were unfaithful, and so they were under a series of judges. They were kind of localized judges that would fight the enemies of God when the people were disobedient and lead the people back to God. But after some time, the people said, we want an earthly king, just like all the other nations around us. We want an earthly king. And so God told Samuel, go ahead, give them an earthly king. And so they had King Saul, who was the king of the whole nation, and then King David, the glory days of Israel. And following David, King Solomon. But after Solomon, the nation split. And the northern part, which was called Israel, they didn't have any good kings. They were all disobedient. They all worshipped false gods. And over time, around seven in the 700s uh, BC, they were conquered by the Assyrians. And they became a, a nation of people that was half Jewish, named after the main city in the area, Samaria. They were Samaritans. The southern part of the nation of Israel became Judah. It was called Judah. And from after Solomon all the way until they got conquered, they had 20 kings. Seven of those kings actually obeyed God and led the nation to obey God. But uh, most of them did not. And God had told them when they went into the nation of Israel that there would be blessings or curses. If they obeyed God, if they trusted God, if they only worshiped God, there would be blessings. If they disobeyed God, if they worshiped the gods, the false gods around them, there would be curses. And the final curse was that God would eventually remove the nation from the promised land. Daniel, Daniel was a prophet, actually a boy, a young man, when this happened. In around 605 BC, Babylon comes and conquers Israel. And he leaves the nation there, but he, they, they have to pay tribute to him, but they kept rebelling. And eventually in, in 586 BC, he wipes the nation out. Daniel comes around though at the front end of this. So Daniel chapter one, now we see how this fits in the picture. Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. All right, I, I got I to gotta stop there because just the, the nation, if you think our politics and our leadership is frustrating and wearisome, they were going through a time, they went through like, Five kings in a very short amount of time. Josiah was the last good king in the southern part in, in Judah. After Josiah, his son <clears throat> Jehoahaz, <clears throat> he, he becomes king. But Egypt, they were disobedient. And so Egypt, God used Egypt to come and he captures Jehoahaz. And, jo and, and so then um, Egypt places a, their own king in, which was actually <clears throat> a, another line of uh, David, 
Jehoiakim, and he's the vassal king. Basically, he's a puppet king of Egypt. He's supposed to do whatever Egypt tells him to do and give money to Egypt. Well, during Jehoiakim's reign, Babylon comes and takes him over and removes Jehoiakim and places in their own vassal king, which is the son of Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin. Well, Jehoiachin disobeys Babylon, and so they come and they conquer him, and they put in his uncle, still the line of David, Metaneah, or they renamed him Zedekiah. But then Zedekiah disobeys Babylon, and so they come and conquer Zedekiah, and then they put in a governor, and they said, we're done with kings, and they put in a go governor named Gedaliah. So all of that you could read in the book of 2 Kings, but it, it's just funny, sometimes you look at history and go, you look at our own government, and you say, we're, we're out of control, and, and we're divided, and, and, and all of this crazy stuff is going on, and I don't know who to believe or who to trust. This is the history of a lot of nations, and it certainly was the history of Israel when they were disobedient. Okay, Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure, in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Athpanez, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language of literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables and said, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding to all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and all kinds of dreams. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Israel and Daniel were deported right? Nebuchadnezzar comes in and conquers Jerusalem, doesn't fully destroy it yet, but takes the best of the best, the royal families and the cream of the crop of the nation, and takes them down into Babylon. And so all of these things were happening to Daniel. He had no control. He's removed from his homeland. And you got to understand that in this time, land and nationality were so closely Related. If you didn't have land, you didn't have a nation. And if you didn't have a nation, you didn't have an identity. You didn't have a people. And so here, Daniel and his people, they lose their identity. They lose their security. They lose their independence. This happened to Daniel. Not only that, he was separated out. He gets into Babylon, but him and his friends, they get removed from their families and removed from the other people. Why? 
because they stood out. They were physically different. It says they were without defect, which is the same uh, description given to like a lamb of the perfect sacrifice. They were without defect. They were perfect. They were handsome. They were pleasing to the eye. They represented all that was good of the nationality of Israel. And intellectually, they were different. Already at the top of their class, they showed this great potential. And so they wouldn't embarrass Israel, nor would they embarrass Babylon. So Babylon brought in these conquered people, but he took the cream of the crop. Nebuchadnezzar took the cream of the crop and he brings them to the palace to serve in the palace. And so Daniel removed from his land, but then also removed from his family and, and the rest of the people and taken and put into the palace. And then the third thing that happened to him, he's thrust into Babylonian culture, this boot camp where he's being trained to think like a Babylonian. Trained for three years. An education not based on the knowledge of God, but an education based on the learning of the Chaldeans, which is um, kind of a, a, a spiritual type of um, false teaching. They learned divination and fortune telling. They, they would learn how to interpret dreams and, and interpret the stars and astrology and interpret sheep livers. No joke, they would cut open sheep and they would examine the livers of the sheep, the innards of the sheep, and they would make prophecies and plans based on what they saw inside of these animals. And Daniel was taught all of this stuff. Rather than to trust in God, he was given an education of idols and superstition and astrology and the wisdom of the world. Now you read the book of Daniel and it proves that God's wisdom is better than man's. But this is what Daniel was thrust onto Daniel. Whatever dreams he had, whatever plans as a young man, whatever goals, suddenly ripped away. He's removed from his land, he's removed from his people, and he's thrust in this Babylonian boot camp. And then he's given a new name. Daniel, the word, the name Daniel means God. Daniel, El, God is my judge. He's given the name Belteshazzar, which means may a God or goddess protect the king. Hananiah. Yah, Hananiah, God, Yahweh, God has been gracious. He's changed to Shadrach, which was a shout out to the God of Marduk or the, uh, to the God Aku. Mishael, El, who is what God is? He is now Meshach, who is what the God of Aku is, the false God. Azariah, Azariah, Yah, God is my help. His name is changed to Abednego, a servant of a God named Nabu or Nago. All of these things, the names in the Near East culture were integral to your personal identity. Your name would call out who your God is, what your culture is. And so Babylon was overtly changing their identity. They already taken their national identity away. And then they take their family identity away and, and thrust them into the palace. And then they're taking their intellectual identity away by giving them a new education. And then they take their personal identity away by giving them a new name. And then they give them new food. Now, Daniel refused it. I don't know what the other food options were for the exiles. Like the ones who didn't get called into the palace, were they put into slave labor and, and then just given food, you know, like... Uh, the food of the common slave, or did they were they put in refugee camps and, and have to fend for themselves? I don't know. But Daniel and his friend, his friends were fed the king's food. They got to eat the same food that was put on the king's table, the best of the land, whatever was suitable for a king. But Daniel opted out of this. Now, what was Babylon doing with these young men? When you conquer a people, there's some options. You can. It could be genocide and you could just kill everybody and get rid of the nation. Or you could harvest the best of the nation and bring them in. And that's what Babylon was doing is politically motivated. They wanted to assimilate the best and the brightest into Babylonian culture. If they take the best and the brightest and use them to serve the king and elevate them in the nation, then the ones that they conquered, that they were slave labor, that they would oppress, they would always look and say, yeah, but we have an Israelite in the palace, we have representation, and it was easier to um, to get allies among the rebels. It was easier to subdue the people, to water down their resistance. A side note to this whole thing: 
even though all of this was out of Daniel's control and all of these things were happening to Daniel, God was never absent from this. In this chapter, you see that God is sovereign in all of this. It was God who delivered Jehoiakim and Judah to Babylon. Babylon couldn't conquer Israel unless God allowed it. It was God who caused the officials to look favorably on Daniel so that when he had a request, they would listen. And it was God who gave Daniel and his friends the knowledge that they have, not Babylon. Look at verse 17 of chapter 1. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds, not because of Babylon, but because God is sovereign. But let's back up. Why did Daniel refuse the diet? That's strange in this whole thing. All these things happening to him, and God is sovereign. But verse 8 Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Why? Why did Daniel refuse the food? Well, there, there's some options here. Maybe, maybe Daniel didn't want to eat the food because of the food laws that the Israelites were under. If you go to the Old Testament, you go to the books of the law, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And this is where God gave the laws to the nation of Israel. And there were food laws in Leviticus chapter 11. It goes through what is a clean animal and what is an unclean animal. What is okay to eat and what was not okay to eat. And the purpose of this was that the people of Israel were to reflect God's holiness. They were to be distinct. They were to be other. And God knew what kind of livelihood they were going to have, and he wanted to keep them healthy. But there's no indication that the king's food in Babylon was not kosher. Certainly wine was not against the food laws. They could drink wine, and, and Daniel refuses the wine. Certainly a youth like Daniel shouldn't be held to dietary laws while deported in captivity. Uh, in a few years, the temple would be destroyed. Daniel taken down to Babylon, he wouldn't be able to go through all of the worship laws and, and go to the temple and offer the sacrifices when he should. Certainly the food laws are much lesser than those worship laws that he wouldn't be able to follow. Maybe this was Daniel taking a stand because the Babylonian food was dedicated to false gods. And eating in that culture was tantamount to fellowship. If I eat a meal with you, then I am in fellowship with you. I'm in agreement with you. And Daniel didn't want to appear to agree or align with the false gods that this food would have been sacrificed to. And he was taking a stand, except that he was going to eat the vegetables. And certainly the vegetables could have been dedicated to the false gods just as easily as the meat and the fruits would have been. Maybe Daniel is making a political statement. Eating the king's food would be fellowshipping with the king, and he didn't want to align himself with the king. Daniel didn't want to show the, that he accepted or he agreed with or he was in a treaty with this Babylonian takeover and the Babylonian leadership. Maybe, maybe this was just the one area that Daniel could control. Everything else was external and done to him. He was taken from home, so his location was out of his control, and separation from his people and his family out of his control. And, and the name he was given, I mean, he didn't have to call himself that, but he had no control over what other people called him. And, and the indoctrination of, of the education, what he was forced to learn and listen to, Judah became a conquered people, and Daniel was deported out by a stronger army, and Daniel was given a new name, and Daniel was forced on this education, and Daniel didn't have a say in any of this. But maybe he had a say in the food, or maybe that's where he thought he could dig his feet in. Food would enter in him, and Daniel didn't want to defile himself. The things potentially, the things happening around him, these, these would have been defiling things. But those were being done to him. Others were defiling him. He didn't want to defile himself by willingly eating the food. And somehow eating the king's food would make Daniel impure. See, I believe that Daniel made a choice 
that he could make. He made a choice to remain pure in the only way he could. Not that the food would defile him in a religious sense, or that eating vegetables would keep him pure, not that vegetables purified him spiritually, but that he would remain pure in his mind and heart. Pure that he was a foreigner in an alien's land, but he was an Israelite, he was going to stay an Israelite, and he would not become a Babylonian, and he would not forego, he would not give in to the tempting food. He would forego that. Pure in that he was an Israelite and a child of God. He was called out to be holy. He was called out to be distinct from the world. Pure that he was fully dependent on God. In a lot of ways, Daniel was at the mercy of the Babylonians. But Daniel was never out of God's hands, never out of God's sovereignty. And Daniel's diet would remain and it would remind him to trust in the sovereignty of God. So he takes a risk. And he approaches the guard that oversees him. Now, a prisoner requesting of a guard is risky to go to a guard and say, hey, I've got a special request. The guard could look at him and go, shut up, peon, you know, and just kick him down. But as already stated, God had greased the wheels. God had already intervened. The prisoner was already seen in a favorable light for this guard. But he's asking this chief official to, to take a risk as well. The, the, this guard has a job to do, which was to take care of the prisoners. And this was the cream of the crop. And they, they were investing a lot of time and energy and money into these, into these uh, young men. And, and to waste one, to turn one in as sickly, as emaciated, because he wasn't eating the food. This would have gotten the guard into a lot of trouble. And so Daniel says, look, let's, we'll just test it 10 days, 10 days. And the guard agreed to that. So you look at verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now listen, Daniel takes a stand, but not to draw attention to himself. This isn't the Daniel show. This isn't uh, uh, to Daniel saying, look how pure I am. Look how wonderful I am. This is another reason that this may not be an Old Testament law issue. Daniel wasn't calling all the deported Jews to do what he was doing. He, didn't, he, he got his three friends to join him, but he didn't go to all those others and say, hey, we're Jews. We shouldn't be eating of this food. This was a, a very private, personal thing that he did. He quietly asked the guard for a different menu. Five people knew about this. Daniel, his three friends, and the guard. That was it. Daniel takes a stand to be pure. This was to purify God's glory in his heart and in his mind. Daniel wanted to be pure in his thoughts of God. It wasn't the food that made him pure. It wasn't that because he only ate vegetables that he was pure. It was the act of obedience. It was the act of surrendering to God. It was a change of his mind. I'm not going to give in and eat this food, even though it looks amazing and it's good enough for a king. I want something lesser. I want to trust God. And as they stood before Nebuchadnezzar, looking healthier than all the others, and none were found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel and his friends could glorify God. As they're pronounced best in class, it wasn't, well, it's because we ate vegetables and you all ate something else. They would glorify God going, knowing that it wasn't Babylon's success. This wasn't man's success. It wasn't Daniel's success. This was God's success. He was the one that purified them. He was the one that made them shine. Now, Daniel's first stand purifies him, but this was the easiest stand because when you go through the book of Daniel, they were going to have tougher stands, right? In Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three friends of Daniel, or otherwise known as Hananiah and uh, Mishael and Azariah, they 
And all the nation was forced to bow down to this statue, and they refused. Again, they didn't get the other Jews to, to refuse with them. They just said, we will not bow down. And they were thrown into the furnace, and, and they made a stand. But the furnace could not consume them. Consume them. And same with Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, the, the leader of the nation of Babylon said, nobody pray to anybody but the leader of the nation for 30 days. And Daniel three times a day threw open his windows and prayed to God. And because of that, he was thrown into the lion's den. And I think it's because of the first step, the purification step to say, I'm not going to eat of this food. I'm going to trust in God. Because of that first step, they were able to take tougher stands later on when their life was on the line took a stand to worship only God. They took a stand to continue to pray to God. And if we don't take the first stand, the easy stand, each future stand becomes more and more difficult. If we don't take the stand of purity, we become a little bit defiled. And when we become a little bit defiled, we become tainted, we become watered down, and it makes it more difficult to stand. And we are called, like Daniel, to live as aliens in a foreign land. Let's move to the New Testament for a second. Jesus, Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. He's hours away from being arrested, put on trial, and then put on the cross. And in John chapter 17, we have this prayer that Jesus makes for the disciples and for us as well. And he says in John 17, verse 14, towards the end of a very long prayer, he says, I have given them your word, Father. And the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, or purify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify means to make holy, it means to make pure. Jesus knows that... It, he knows what it's like to live in this world. He lived in this world and, and he dealt with every temptation that we deal with and he battled the world and yet he did not sin. The world tried to tame Jesus and he would not be tamed by it. He remained pure and he prays for our protection as well. Yeah, we're, we're called to stay in this world. We don't get to go to heaven immediately when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're called to stay here and bring glory to God. And we live in this world that has been turned over to Satan through sin. When we sin and all those who choose to sin are obeying Satan and giving Satan allegiance, giving him rule. And so the world no longer functions as it was intended to function. And we are not living as we were designed to live. We're, we weren't designed to live in sin and darkness. Adam and Eve were created in perfection. We chose sin and darkness. We weren't designed to live under the shadow of death, knowing that each and every person faces mortal death. We weren't designed to live apart from God. And so we search the things of this world, but because we weren't designed for the things of this world, the sin of this world, we find that we're never satisfied. It never feels right. But there is purity available to us. God's word, Jesus prays, God's word is purifying. It is pure truth and it purifies us. It goes against the world. The, 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 the truth of God goes to battle against the truth of this world and it wins. That's how it purifies. The world's wisdom is limited. The world's women, uh, wisdom is limited in what we can see, hear, and experience and show. That's science, right? The world's wisdom is limited by what we can, only what we can see, hear, experience, and know. God's wisdom is revealed to us through the Holy Spirit, and it has no bounds. There is no end. We cannot even fathom the wisdom of God. The world's wisdom is constantly changing. It's never secure. It never stays in place. It is constantly evolving or changing God's wisdom is the same because it doesn't need to change because it is true the world's wisdom is subjective each person experiences truth differently God's wisdom is true for all people God's pure word is found in the Bible and this true word brings us purity it defeats the lies of this world 
It focuses on what is true and unchanging, and it sanctifies us. It cleanses us. It changes us. It sets us apart. It makes us holy. It makes us pure. And so like Daniel, we're thrust into a culture that, that's at odds with our faith. And there are many things out of our control. There, and the, the images of media, we can't control every time we put on the computer what is thrown in front of us, what is offered, what is promised, driving down the highway, the freeway, the billboards that are constantly bombarding us. We can't control all that. The laws of the culture that allow people to do horrific things we can't control that. The leaders that make decisions based on, on tainted wisdom or selfishness or self-preservation, we can't control that. Mankind is its own God in this culture, and we can't control that. But we are called to pursue purity within this culture. I may not be able to control what my neighbor does, but I can control my response and my love for my neighbor. I may not be able to change what my school teaches, but I can control how I receive it and teach against it. I may not be able to change the law on abortion, but I can help someone choose life. I may not be able to change who holds office, but I can pray for them continually, trusting in God. Daniel didn't push his diet on the Babylonians. Daniel didn't go to the, the guard or the Babylonians and say, you need to eat only vegetables like me. Nor did his friends push their worship uh, of the one true God rather than the idol. Nor did Daniel push his prayer disciplines on the Babylonians. They just did what they did. They lived differently in culture. And Babylon noticed the difference and God was glorified. It's not, always, it's not always our responsibility to change the culture. We have to change ourselves within the culture. It may not always be our goal to change culture. We're just called to live in this culture and remain pure in this culture and be a light in this culture. And purity, godliness, righteousness is not received by force. We can't force purity and godliness and righteousness on others. It always has to be a choice. And so we are called to focus on purity. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever is pure, the word is hagnos, hagnos. Originally, the word meant, this is awesome, what is, awakens awe. Purity. What awakens awe? This is our response when we see something pure. If you're out on vacation and you see a pure sunset unfiltered by smog or smoke or a pure sunrise, just beautiful day starting or a glorious mountain lake scene where the, the water mirrors the, the landscape or, or an ocean that's just rocky and beautiful and, and the power of God... When you see these things, this awakens awe in us. When you see something pure, like a pure gold or a pure diamond, it awakens awe. What wins the, 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 the competition? It's the purebred dog. The purebred, pure, awakens awe. Our children, when we see them sleeping innocent and pure, uh, that's when we're in awe. Purity is more about what isn't there sometimes than what is. Something is pure because it isn't tainted. Something is pure because it isn't watered down or diluted. It has no filler, nothing distracting or, or trying to enhance. It is something in its simplest form, and we need to think about what is pure, the gospel in its simplest form. What isn't there is almost as important as what is there. And so like Daniel, we live in a godless and perverse culture. And so much is thrust upon us that distracts us or waters down our faith or tries to enhance, tries to enhance our faith with the things of this world. And it oftentimes makes things more complicated. And we must continually draw from what is pure. First John chapter 3, the, the Apostle John writes this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, 
that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it, does, it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. This is the pure gospel. This is why we need to focus on what is pure so that we will be purified. Pure doesn't mean it means it's easy. I, I, I use the word simple because it, it, it's stripped down, but it's not easy. The message is simple, but purity comes through maturity, allowing this simple message to permeate every aspect of our lives. And so we need to take a stand like Daniel. Daniel took a stand against the king's food. Maybe it was out of concern for food laws or sacrifice to idols. I don't think so. I think it was a way for him to stay focused on God and trust in God and stay pure in a difficult time. How do we know we're remaining pure? How do we know we're remaining pure and not sliding into defilement or giving in over and over to the world controlled by Satan or, or growing complacent or cold in God's message? How do we know that our gospel message isn't being tainted by politics or nationalism or false gospel messages like, like a prosperity gospel, like everybody who's a Christian is wealthy and healthy or works gospel that you earn salvation through works? How do we know we're remaining pure on the gospel of Christ? Let me encourage you to pursue purity to focus on a changed mind and focus on the simplicity of the gospel. Maybe like Daniel, you could practice some disciplines. Disciplines do not save us or make us better than. Disciplines are a way to trust God. Eating the right food didn't save Daniel. Sacrificing good food focused his mind on God. And so we need to replace things in our life, sacrifice and, and practice disciplines so that we could have more purity. Sacrifice media for scripture and prayer. Sacrifice eating out for fasting and prayer. Sacrifice our freedoms and, and the indulgences that we're allowed to do for surrender and sacrifice and prayer. Constant Sacrifice constant activity. Some of our families are just go, 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 go all the time. Got to make sure we experience everything we could possibly experience. Maybe we need to sacrifice that for resting and meditation and trusting in God and prayer. Maybe we need to sacrifice worshiping our family so that we can serve our neighbors with our time and our services and our prayers. It is a summer to change our minds, whatever is true, God's word, whatever is noble, desiring the presence uh, to be an elder, whatever is right, God's heart, whatever is pure, simply God's gospel, whatever is lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, these will come in future weeks. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your pure word, that it is true, that it's been true, it's always been true. It was true when it was written down. It is true today. It has not changed. God, we pray that you would focus our minds. Help us to sacrifice the things that are not pure so that we can focus on your gospel, which is pure, and be changed. I pray these things in your name. Amen. God bless you, Shore Life. I love you. Hope to see you soon. If you're healthy, if you're available, come to the park. Let's love each other and encourage each other together.